Okay, let's get started. Well, I did prepare a set of lecture notes for today. I didn't send you emails, I forgot. Um, I also got busy. And before class, I decided to start with something else. And then I go back to lecture notes. So there's actually three different um, notebooks that we can use to run on Spark using Scala. Um, here is a second one. Um, and it's, it's called Spark Notebook. Um, and so I, I've well, been using it for a little bit, a few days to see what it can do. So here's a simple example. Remember last time we talked about these GRE, um, Remember? No. What's that? Didn't sound very confident. And so here I am, you know, it doesn't have a Spark um, configuration, so I have to create your own. So I created it. Um, in Spark session, and then I want to read it using um, the schema, so I get types right, and then I can read it, um, and then I split the data into training set. Um, And then I took a training set and selected just a GRE and GP, and I collected them. And we can we can look at it as you know a table, which is sort of nice. Um, but since there's two two columns, we can also look at it um, by the standard plot. Doesn't make too much sense, but we could also do it as a line, right? Um, and also, doesn't make sense to, when it, but they have built in some visualizations, right? You know, and then we can do exactly what we did last time is just we can create a pipeline. Um, in this case, I just looked at, you know, using a GRE and GPA to see what you emit um, and do logistic regression, create the pipeline, fit the pipeline. Um, and then we can uh, get the model and, and then print out information about the model. Um, You know, last time we also talked about decision trees, so why not try doing a decision tree on it? Um, so again, I just start all over again. So I get a complete example, schema, read it. Um, in this case, I'm not going to do the pipeline. I'm just going to do it directly, the simpler. Um, use all, all three features. Um, you know, you have to fit it and then you parrots and then once I've done that um, I divide in a training set and a um, test set and then we can look at the training set and again we get um, we get a table right that's sort of nice um, 
then we can then page through all the data, which is even even nicer. Whereas in the previous, right, in the Jupyter notebook, we can only get, we can do a show and then we can see how, how many we want, but And then we do, I do the same thing with the test data set so we can see it, see what's in there. Um, and then, you know, to actually do the decision tree, it's actually pretty simple. Um, and the ML library divides decision trees into whether you want to be a regression model or classifier. Doing the regressor, um, create the regressor, and then we can, again, we fit the data, and then we train it. Um, and then we can actually um, look at the predictions, and we get the, you know, it's a, it's a data frame, right? And so we can. Again, just see it. And one thing we note is we get a predictions column, but it doesn't, it's not binary. It's not admit or not admit. And it gives us a probability. So far, so good. And then it's like, well, we, we would not like to try it on our test set, right? Um, well, before I do that, what I did is it turns out we can, um, on our model, we can, if it's a decision tree, um, Actually, in any model, we can do the two, two debug string. And the interesting thing there is it gives you the decision tree. Right? So it's, it's, just, it's just a big tree, right? And each node is like, well, is this true or not? And you go left or right. And so it starts off as a feature two is that one or less, then we, we, we branch on that, right? What was feature two again? Of all the features, the features were the, their GPA. So GPA is gonna be, you know, four or less, right? There's also GRE scores, which they're using the old score, so it goes from 800 to zero. Actually, I don't think you, I'm not sure you can get a zero, but um, and then the the rank was one, two, three, and four, right? Um, and you know, feature one is clearly the grade, GR, and the feature zero is is clearly <laughs> the GRE score. So feature two is. Um, the rank and says if it's feature two is less than, less than or equal to the, and then if, right, less greater than that, and then we do a feature again, and then we predict zero, right? And so we just, we're creating this tree, and since we've got, we've got these continuous values, we can branch on the same feature set multiple times. Right, so it's just, you know, it's just the first node, look at the third feature, yes or no, right? In this case, it's, is the feature one or less? In that case, you go down here. If it's greater, then you go down here, right? We just branch, branch, branch. And, Using this regression evaluator, we can now, you know, get the the root mean square error. Um, 
what does that mean? Well, you look at the prediction and the area you get right, and then you you square all that so it gives you get some negatives, and then. But of course, the problem now is we will, we want to. Um, when I take my model and transfer my test set, I'd like to see, you know, where my test set, the predictions differ from what was actually done, right? How do we do that? How would I select the rows where the prediction does not match? And how would we do that? Does anyone have any idea how we would now select the rows where our prediction will not give us what actually happened? What's that? And how would we round it? Not super sure that there's like an explicit function for this, but you can definitely see a way in Scala where there's a way to uh, either ceiling or floor the decimal value on uh, whether or not they're less than one. I like that. It's because we want our predictions to remain zero or one. So probably just lower the value or the or the decimal. If we were to bring the data frame into Scala, then we could use map. Right? How are we doing Spark? What's that? Yeah, but how do we, what do we do in Spark to do that? Yeah, so we can select the two columns, right? Um, but then how do we compare them? In Spark.
And so at this point, I'm going, oh, what's needed here is more practice. Right? Um, did, what's that? And how do you write the select statement? And what does a select statement do? Right. Yes, but finding a wall of prediction is greater than 0 0.5 doesn't tell me, doesn't get, get us what we want. Right? Because we want to know. You probably don't have to round up. You can probably just overwrite the value you found that satisfies that condition in one or zero. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so like I said, I think here's where we need more practice, right? Because until you come across these problems, you don't think about it, right? And all the various transformations we can do um, And actually, there is a built-in function to do what we want. The binary, and you can specify the breakpoint, right? And we can specify the input row, input column, the output column. Right, and so I'm adding a column, and I'm any less than you know, point 0.5 becomes a breakpoint. Um, and now we can start doing our where expression and say, okay, where <coughs> labels not equal to our. So I, I think we've come to the part of the semester where I need to spend less time thinking about preparing lecture notes, more time about grading and having more assignments. Right, so you, 
you come across these problems and start to internalize. Okay, any questions? So I want to talk about visualization. Um, but then um, I did come across an article about Agile. Um, Data science, you know, that, that because it started, and I realized, oh, you probably didn't have the background. Um, and the background was, goes back into the, in the 90s, um, late 80s. There was a software crisis. People were complaining about prod, software products being too expensive and taking too long and too many are failing. They're going over budget. And so there was this, Everyone in the software world was worried about this supposed software crisis. Um, at the same time, people in software engineering were sort of feeling that they wanted to be more engineering-like. And actually, there was a time on this campus when the engineering department um, was trying to stop the computer science department from teaching a course called software engineering. Why? Because said, what they teach in that course is not engineering. And we're like, that's what everyone else in the country calls it. And actually, the, the debate went out to the president of the university, and he, he wasn't willing to decide, so it went on for years. And um, I think eventually the president re retired, and the engineering department got tired of arguing about it. And there was actually an agreement saying, okay, they could teach whatever they wanted, and we could teach whatever we wanted, and neither side would complain. Um, but there was definitely this feeling of how can we build software better? And so we, we want to be more engineering like, more scientific like. So we started getting these processes um, ex to ex explain how to build software. Um, and at one point, there was this software process where the, when you bought the complete set of books, the manual explained the process. It took an entire bookshelf, right? Um, thousands and thousands of pages, which programmers didn't read because who's going to read, you know, 5,000 pages of a process to tell you how to write software? I mean, it doesn't happen. Um, and so our reaction to that is this agile software development process started. So here, you know, Scrum started in 1995. Um, 96, there was two that came out, Crystal Clear and Extreme Programming. At the time, Extreme Programming was a better known because the name was um, clever and it was catchy and the programmers liked it. Of course, managers didn't. Why managers don't like to do extreme things. Um, and so there's always processes coming up in Agile. And then in 2001, um, a group of programmers, developers got together at a ski resort in Colorado. And, into, and they produced it called the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. And, you know, they, they define four key values. You know, one was that people and interactions are more, you should value that more than processes and tools. Um, you know, working software is more important than comprehensive documentation. Um, you know, collaboration is more important, should be valued more than contract negotiation. And responding to change is more important than following a plan, right? What's that?
And they also came out with a bunch of software development principles. Um, you know, satisfy the customer early and can you, and can you say deliver, you know, so you want to, as soon as possible, provide something that's working, right? Not full feature set, but it's working. And you can, and usually you want to figure out the most important features to the customer and do those first, right? And then you do the second most important feature. And at some point the customer say, well, it's good enough, I'm done. Um, you know, if you ever develop software, I mean, it, there's always changes, right? The customer always wants changes. There's always, you always, you learn something and say, oh, it's, I mean, wait, no, this won't work when you do it that way. There's always changes coming in. Um, and one of the key things, and this is mine, is that you always want to deliver, you want to do it in steps. Um, the smaller the steps, the better. Why? Because if you wait six months to deliver something, you're going to spend the first two months just goofing around or fiddling your fingers or, I mean, you're planning and planning and planning and planning and planning, right? And then after two months of planning, you start developing and in the third week, realize there's problems with your plan, right? And then the customer comes in, so oh, I don't want that that anymore. Or when you finally show them a pro, you know the first version, they say, "Oh, wait, I didn't realize you could do that." And that, can you just can you modify to do this? There's always these changes, so it's always it's also why it's really bad to give you know give students like a month to do an assignment, right? What's going to happen? Yeah, you figure out the last minute is well. I think this will take two weeks, right? And so I'll do my other assignments, and then two weeks before I'll start, and then you realize, oh wait, it's going to take me three weeks. So, um, right. So smaller steps are always better, right? Because you can you can target it. You find out what you're doing. Um, You know, they, they want developers and customers to work together to figure out, you know, when you, when you go to customer, when you get their requirements, you go away for six months or a year and you come back to them, um, there's always surprises and that's a problem. Um, programmers like this one, you should trust your developers, encourage them, give them responsibility, right? Not just treat them like slaves. Um, it's always interesting to read about projects where a year project after six months, the manager wakes up and discovers they're, they're four months behind schedule. Like, how can you be four months behind schedule in a six month? Right, and how can you discover all of a sudden you're four months behind schedule? I mean, yesterday you weren't, and today you are. I mean, um, this one is sort of subtle, but it means you probably don't want to be working seventy hours a week for ten weeks in a row. It's not going to work. You can't do it. Um, Right. Um, you know, so these are you know, the principles they came up with. Um, He's tired, let him sleep. Um, and so that was the background, right? And this was being a famous manifesto. And so I came across this manifesto for agile, agile data science. So the, the, the guy used to be a software developer and they switched over to being a data scientist and his first job. Um, and they had this project and then you spent Here's what you wanted to do, and then they spent months planning it, and then more months implementing it, and it was a disaster. And he goes, "No, no, this is not. This is not. I mean, 
it's not a good thing, right? So he, he recognizes the problem, want to develop, bring his agile thoughts into his doing data science. So he, he's working on this manifesto, right? And he came up with, well, um, first is you iterate. I mean, You've got data you're trying to understand what's going on. It's not you're not going to get the correct the right answer right away, right? It's going to take take some understanding. You fiddle here, fiddle that, fiddle this, um, right? You know, you, you look at this, you look at that, and you're trying to figure out how, what's going on in the data. So there's a lot of iteration. Um, and the problem he has is well, you know, if we're trying to model on Agile software development, where you got these short, what they call sprints, right? And at the end of a sprint, you have something working, and you can then show some. How do you do this here? When what you're doing is you're you're just trying to understand what's going on, right? Well, in that case, well, we can ship. You know, you're doing experiments, you're you're trying things out, but you can still, you know, commit that to a source control system. That can so that can be your Here's what I've done so far, right? Um, maybe you've got worksheet, you know, these crazy notebooks, and um, you can put them, share them with a group, and see here's what I've done, here's what we can do, what I've learned. Um, and he says, yeah, you're trying to explore, understand the data. Um, You know, so this experimentation is bigger in data science than it is in software development. Software development, how do you how do you get this feature done? Well, I don't know. You think about it, right? And you think about it and you might try this or that and then realize, oh, this is what I'm gonna do it. But there's a lot more experimentation of you know, how am I going to get that column of probabilities to zeros and ones? So oh, I have to think about that. You're trying to draw a connection. You may not have necessarily a direct immediate goal, right? Um, just like trying to um, pull, you have this like giant ball of data that's just kind of aggregated there. You want to like pull meaningful patterns and information out of it. Yeah, and what are the patterns? You don't know, right? How do you find them out? Well, you experiment and you try things, right? So it's a, it's a different type of process. Um, One of my favorite stories about data science is um, Target. Um, at one point, they figured out um, when women get pregnant, they come up, they, they have certain behavior to discover. One is they start buying bigger purses. Another one is they, they stop buying lotions which are perfumed and buy unscented um things and so when they discovered this um they then would they sent they would target people with special flyers saying oh here's all this baby stuff um and of course what happened is they sent these flyers out and one local store got this angry father in saying why are you sending my daughter these flyers about, you know, baby things. Um, and of course, the store manager is completely, I mean, nothing to do with it, right? As a corporate, it did it. Um, and eventually, the guy came back and apologized, saying, like, well, my daughter was pregnant. Um, 
But target learned to know what you don't, you don't send, you send targeted flyers, but you mix in the baby items with other things, right? And so they don't think that you're stalking them. Really, I mean, don't you, don't you feel stalked when you, um, do a search for a product and then for the next week, all, all your ads on your web pages are that product and go, they're, they're stalking me. Um, but how do you, how do you discover this, right? It's not like you can imagine they spend a lot of time just examining data and finding trends, um, to, to discover that, right? about how the world works and not always having access to correct information. Right. Everybody's online now. The information's there, so you can have a question. Yeah, and... Once you have that, you have these very facts. Yeah. Where do I find uh, any sites where I get? So I have a recommended for you thing. Is that... No, trust us. Like we have all the data. Right. It's your best interest. interest. It's for you. Right. And it, it's not as intrusive as say seeing like an ad randomly on like a Yahoo page. page right. You're like okay, well they are intended. They intended to recommend you. Right. But also you log on to their account, right? So you log into your account on their page, so it, yeah. it's not as bad. All the time. Right. Now, the reason I want to talk about this Agile Manifesto for Data Science is because his data value pyramid. Um, <laughs> the higher up to go in the pyramid, the more value you get, right? Um, and the very bottom is what we're doing, right? Is just collecting data, manipulating it, creating right records and transforming them. Um, and then we get up to clean, aggregate, visualize, and question, right? And then creating reports. And making predictions and then providing actions. And the one thing we haven't looked at really is the visualization of um, Yeah, then it's the critical you know, finding out, you know, what's the best way to get to your goal. Um, you know, you know just focus on the analytic process. What step did you take to come up with the answer as opposed to just here's the answer? So well, that's a manifesto. Um, so using notebooks is, you know, some of you had a slight struggle to get it working. Um, once it's working, it, it, it does provide a way of playing with that a little bit, right? Um, you know, so we're using the Jupyter Scala. Um, there's also Apache Zeppelin. Its main feature is that you can you can use it with AWS. Um, we probably won't do that. Um, the problem is it's very easy to stop to ter forget to stop running your cluster, and you just log on and you. Run it and they go, oh, I try this and try this and I'm I, okay, there's my answer. I can now turn my assignment in and then you can close your browser and the cluster is still running away, chewing up money because to run 
that um, you can't do stop at the end of this. Um, Strax notebooks. Um, and that's what we saw earlier. The nice thing is it does have some charting, um, still limited. Um, and if you want to play with it, um, when you go there, you want to get the master version and set the scale of version. It turns out their default settings when you try and download it don't work. Why? Well, I, I don't know. You, you try and say, I'm sorry, but that doesn't work. And I, and why is it the default? I mean, And also to start preparing, to thinking about doing projects. Um, here are some data sets you might want to start looking at. Um, UCI Irving and machine learning repository is pretty famous. It has lots of stuff. Um, R data sets. These are data sets that come with R for um, people who use it for teaching. Um, Amazon has some some public data sets, um, and, and they don't. The first two, the data sets are fairly small. Um, Amazon, they don't care, right? Um, they're substantially bigger. Um, and machine learning, I mean, there's a lot of them. Um, and they'll, they'll group them, you know, classified based upon the, what task you want to use. Um, and they give you a list and you can do a searches and you can, um, our data sets, here's a, you know, URL to see a list of them all. Um, and they give a brief description. And there's also the CVS and the documentation to explain what each column is, where it came from, et cetera. So remember dwell times. Um, so here's a visualization of, drill, of, of that data. And the axis are um, the time, right? And the number of items, number of, um, and already, you've probably learned something you didn't see before, right? But it makes sense in that you expect there to be a lot of small dwell times and fewer, fewer really long dwell times, right? And actually, we're gonna look at this exponential distribution, look something like that. Um, and one trick is if you then take the log of one of the axes, distribu uh, exponential distribution like this becomes linear. When we do that um, on the dwell time, you know, we get, per, you know, the end sort of breaks up a bit, right? And if we actually look at, um, we bend the data and look at the mean dwell time, um, we get sort of two peaks. And if you look at the weekend versus the week, um, 
just looking at it, you start realizing, oh, look, okay, um, weekdays is a peak about 90, and weekends, well, it's some, it's, it's definitely higher, right? Being able to create these charts and graphs, plots easily helps that exploration and experimentation, understanding the data. And unfortunately, um, using the notebooks, we don't get that, right? With the Jupyter notebook, we cannot, um, imp there are plotting libraries that can do the scale of, but we can't do an import of external libraries. Um, we'll look, you know, we'll look, in, in the near future, we'll look at a plotting library we can do the scale of to start doing some of these things. Um, the grad school one, um, you know, we can start trying to look at GPA versus GRE, and you start. And you can see the data is pretty much all over the map, right? For very low GRE score, grade scores, right, um, then we don't get very high juries, right? You're all pretty low, but once we get a certain point, it just booms out, right? And there's a slight, um, the bottom curve, I mean, the bottom data set goes up a little bit, right? So there's a slight as, your GPA gets higher and higher. Um, there's still a widespread, but the bottom um, lower scores aren't quite as low. So you wouldn't expect there to be a high court, I mean, high correlation, and we're all the way down to 2.8. We're getting you know perfect GRE scores, right? Just being able to look at the data and play with it like this um, looking at the ranking again we don't you know it's hard to see but um, so looking at the rank versus GPA. You know, at the first rank schools, not many low GPAs, a lot higher GPAs. Um, but the same thing with a, right, the, the rank four schools, except for one. So we get a wider range of GPAs in the middle ranks. Why? A lot, a lot of the high power places think, well, we only met really, really good students, so we're not going to give any C's. Right? And, you know, if you're at the bottom of the barrel school place, and luckily we won't give any C's because we want to keep our paying customers happy. Right? Looking at the GRE versus um, rank. Um, you know, again, we it might be because there's more data in the first two ranks, but we, we get some very low GRE scores at number one rank. Um, actually worse than
each other. Yeah. So yeah. Like, kind of like, and size. right. Yeah. That's why. That's why some of the dots are lighter and darker. Yeah. So again, it's just being able to play with the, and visualize this stuff really helps this exploration process. Um, third example, um, in the R data sets, there's this one data set is an academic salaries and you get the rank and there's three ranks. Um, top rank is full professor. Right. Um, and then the associate and assistant professor. And then there's two disciplines. One is more scientific and engineering. Um, then how many years since they got their PhD and how long they've been um, teaching. And then their sex and then their salary. Right. So when we when we do this um, in our Jupyter notebook, we can just basically you know, we get this table. Um, you know, the Spark notebook, we can get more of the table and we can then start doing um, various other things. Um, and, you know, we can select here the service versus salary. Um, And there is some of a trend. I mean, the first year you don't learn much, but then it, but it spreads out. Or so some people don't get raises very much, and some people go up. And then after a certain point, it's you're pretty much stuck, right? Um, you know, this doesn't give us anything useful. Um, Salary versus your service. Um, helpful, but still somewhat limited. Some some graphs which might be a little easy. Might you know here looking at um, the salary. Um, How many people got that particular salary? And then uh, doing it by by sex, um, it's hard to tell because half of it's sort of hidden underneath the blue. Um, you know, again, it doesn't quite help us much, right? Here is the salary based upon your rank. Um, well, the assistant professor is early on, then we get some associates, then the blues go higher for the professor. Um, it's not quite as useful as doing this. Yeah, so here again we're plotting a year since PhD and the salary. Um, and then we're color coding it by the, by the rank. And so here are the social professors. Um, notice there's no, the, the farthest to go for for the social professors is like year 11. Um, why is that? Well, typically you get um, well, after six years, either they promote you or they fire you. And the reason you get beyond six years is because you may go to do a postdoc 
or you may go to one school, right, and then switch to another school, right? Um, and then you, you then you get the associate professors, um, and then um, we get the the full professors, and then you'll see this particular plot method actually then shows you um, it, it does a least squares fit on the on the data, and so for assistant and associate professors, the salary actually goes down the longer you've been out of school. No, this is what they did is they went out and surveyed faculty at some school or some schools, right? And they said, what's your salary now? How long have you been working? So no, this is not saying, oh, your buying power is less now than it was. They're saying the people now who've been working 30 years from the PhD, their income is less than the people who have been working 10 years. That's what they're saying. What's that? Um, if you look at the full professors, that's pretty flat. Not going down, um, but there is a widespread, right? Right. Kind of coalesces around that out, whether there be real world What you're saying here is what is known as salary inversion. Um, what happens is when you hire someone new, you basically have to pay a competitive salary. Otherwise, um, they'll go somewhere else, right? It's happening in industry all the time. Um, but, but once you get, it's happening in industry too, right? In industry, the easiest way to get a salary raise is to change jobs, right? Why? Because they have to pay you a competitive rate. And they also think that, they probably think that they pay you a higher salary than your current earning, otherwise you'd stay where you are. Um, Academics, once they they don't tend to move very much, and so what happens is you may get a, occasion to get a raise, but the people coming in, right, have to be offered a competitive salary, right? Um, so what happens is often you get people who've been here longer being paid less than the people coming in, and this is just just plotting the data, right? This one plot shows us this, right? It shows us, oh, right? Social professors die out some, for some reason. I mean, social professors, the social professors, again, we get a few, but most of them either um, presumably become full professors or they go elsewhere, right? There's a lot of information just from looking at the. Um, these box plots. So what we're looking at is um, salaries for male and female. Um,
this is the box, these are the hinges. Um, what this box tells you is this white line in the middle is a median salary. So when, when, when we're looking at the salaries, male versus female, the median salary is almost identical, right? Um, then the third quartile and the first quartile, that is, okay, there's 25% of the people earn less than this, 25% of the people are in here, 25% of the people are here, and 25% of the people are above that, right? Um, then this whisker on top, the fence, uh, then the whisker. Um, different people will do it slightly differently. That's why this is called the, the two key method. It's um, you know one point five times IRQ, which is the, the third quartile versus the second quartile. So as you take this difference, multiply one point five, um, and then you add that to the third quartile. That, just to give an estimate of how many people are there, you know, a range. Um, and then when, th when data falls outside that, you then plot the points to show that there, there are people outside that. Um, but you see that in the males, right, um, this quartile is bigger in range than, it, than below, right? Um, where the females is opposite. And the range is, is, is compressed. Again, just, just plotting, right? Um, There's theoretical as applied. Um, again, you see that you expect the theoretical people are paid a little bit less. Or even physics, right? Theoretical physics. Um, Trying to look for the way that representing data, so it's yeah. I mean, that, um, the, you're trying to understand the data. What's, what 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 do we know, what can we learn from this data, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So when we look at this. Um, you know, this is a. You know, for for a long, long time, the the salary differential between females and males has been a big deal, right? Um, and now we're going you know, here it is. We have a data set. We can see that, well, the median is pretty much the same, but, right, the range is, is significantly different, right, for the females. Now we can ask, um, theoretical people are paid less, right? And when we go by rank, um, again, the system has paid less associate, you know, more. And now we can say, okay, if we're interested in this, we could ask the question, why are females getting paid less? Um, it could be that um, for a long time, right, there were more males than females at the university level, right? And so what we're, what we're maybe seeing is part of the fact that um, there are more associate, associate professors that are females than there are 
right? Professors. Um, Right. No, the data set is just professors and theoretical was applied. Now here's another um, way of displaying data. It's called the bees swarm. Um, you know, so we're professors, here's other salaries, um, and of course when we get people with the same salary, you know, they get stacked this way. And here we're, we are also coloring by sex. Um, so now we can start to see, yeah, there's, Clearly more males and females, right? Um, you know, at the assistant professor, um, there seems to be more females at the lower end of the scale. Top one is female, right? There's two outliers, right? Um, when you go to social professors, there seems to be two groups, right? Um, when the professor level, it seems to be more uniformly scattered. Don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Um, the problem with using public data sets is. You don't know, you don't know if the data is like an accurate representation. Um, if you go back to the original source, usually they'll, they'll give you, um, and this data came from this paper. Hopefully, right, but yeah. Um, and then what they call a violin plot, it's the same sort of formation, but instead of being dots, it gives you uh, this shape. You know, one last example, um, the iris data set. Um, it, it comes from this 1936 paper. It's, it's everywhere. Um, when you look at their data set, it's number of hits it's got is over a million. It's the most popular data set there. Um, and all it does is it describes irises and the, the sh basically the width and the, and the length of petals versus um, sepals. And like, what's a sepal? Um, according to Wikipedia, um, the petal is a is, the flower part and the sepal is the part below that protects it. Um, you know, and you start doing various plots, um, sepal width versus length, it's sort of hard to see, but all these are blue up here. Um, and that's one of the species, there's three species in the data set, and then there's red, and black, and they're sort of scattered together. Um, doing the petal width and length. Again, the, you know, one species is highly separated. 
and the other two um, mainly red, then it starts some black and then all black, right? So the reason this data set is used a lot is because we can now use it to experiment with various um, ways of classifying, and that one should be perfect, right? And then you expect problems between the boundary here. So you have, it's used a lot for that. Of course, we're gonna do all kinds of these things. Um, and so there's, Kaggle is this website where people post data sets and post challenges and vote on people solve these challenges, post data sets and explain them and give notebooks. Um, and so there's two of them you want to look at. Um, decision boundary is visualized. You know, basically they're talking about, you know, if I use decision trees or clustering, how do I know, how can we do detect, right? Um, another one just talks about data visualization. Um, and so what we're gonna do on Thursday is we're, when I say we, I mean you. Um, we have this room with all these monitors and computers, right? So we want to take that data set um, and then use decision trees to try and classify it and then look at the logistic regression and random force classifier to on a week from today. Questions, uh, number of questions, uh, coding challenges, scary, or with books. We'll know more on Thursday. <laughs>